So, okay, my goal today is uh, basically get that piston out of there. So what I have to do, lift the car up, take the cradle, remove it. Um, that way I can get the oil pan off. It's going to be quite a task to remove. I'm going to try a little bit more time-lapse stuff today. I kind of liked that yesterday. Um, so, I guess, I guess I'll get started here. So, as far as the cylinders go, um, the water jacket that surrounds them is just filled with coolant, right? Uh, I have this little plastic hose. The, the hose is pretty small. It fits right inside the water jacket there. And then I take my air nozzle and I hit it at a certain angle, just enough to create a, a siphon effect uh, until I get fluid in there. And then I can just let it drain down into the pan below. So that's kind of what I'm a, what I do every time I pull one of these off. It helps with not having antifreeze constantly fighting you every time you do something. Um, just makes life easier. Okay, what you just saw me do on the other side, I just take the air nozzle and the antifreeze that was in the cylinders before, I can only wipe out so much. Uh, it always sits right down between the piston and where the ring land is and the cylinder wall. I uh, can't get it out all the way, so I take an air nozzle and I just blow it out and then I wipe down the cylinder. Okay, my next step I'm going to take is preparation for the new piston. Uh, before I slide this one out, I have to fix that little ding that you could see in the previous episode, I guess you could call it. Uh, if I slide it out as is, without cleaning up that ding, it'll end up uh, damaging the rings. And I actually want to reuse these rings because these rings are seated to the cylinder. They literally have just seated fairly recently because the motor's not that old. Uh, so I don't want to put new rings in it. I'd rather keep the old rings. I might replace the oil ring. That's not a big deal. Uh, it gets all dirty on some engines anyway. I doubt this one's dirty. So I'm going to clean up that edge. And then I'm going to clean up the, the carbon that's above where the top ring goes. That way the piston rings don't have to push that as well. Basically the main thing is that ding though. So I'm going to take a little sander. After I prepare covering the motor, um, I'm going to have to protect the rest of the motor. I don't want any of that debris getting in there. The reason I'm doing it now as well, on top of preventing damage to the rings, is to keep that, that sanding stuff from going down into the bottom half of the motor. While the rings are there, it's fairly sealed up. It, it's, it's hard for it to get past those rings. There's a small gap at the end of each ring. and they're usually offset. Uh, when you put the motor together, or when I put the motor together, I set them offset. They don't always stay there, but you hope that they do, or at least they stay reasonably close. I'm gonna give you a look at what I'm doing before I do it. Okay, so you can see I have the tape and the rag protecting this half and then I have a towel just laying over that half. That half isn't as likely to get anything in it. In fact, I better tuck that there. Um, simply because it's on the other side of the motor and this side I'm grinding right with the deck, right? So I'm going to take it and just sand that little, see if I can get a better image of it than I did yesterday with you. That little ding right there. I'm going to see if I can sand that smooth without going below that carbon mark. Because if I go below that carbon mark, I'm going to affect the top ring seal. And that's not what I want to do. So I'm going to very carefully take this little sander. In fact, 
Oh, that's fine enough. I want to make sure it's a fine enough disc. I'm going to take that little sander and just kiss the, the edge until when I, when I touch it with my finger like this, I don't feel a bump or, or a high spot. And then I'm going to take a hand sander with like three or four hundred grit sandpaper and really carefully take my hand and go right around this edge just to clean up that that carbon ridge it's, it's technically not a ridge because there's no ring ridge um, but the carbon area just so that the pistons don't have to clean it or the rings don't have to clean it off when they come out Okay, that's all that took. Just a little touch. Here's the paper I'm going to use. It's a 320 wet dry paper. I have. I don't think I have a reason to get it wet. I'm just going to take this and try and clean up that ridge or carbon. There's one more little ding that was next to that one. I'll show you in a minute where it's at because it's a dent in. Um, it's not really sticking out too much, just a little bit. So I'm just going to kiss that quick. It too is also above that ring land. Okay, so you can see I brought out the WD. Um, WD-40 is a really good cleaner. Uh, it leaves a little residue of an oil film behind. Uh, that's also good, especially when working on uh, iron, because iron rust. So it prevents it from rusting while you have it apart. So I use that to wipe the cylinder walls for my final wipe. You saw me use the brake clean a second ago. But let's get a look here. Oh, get the light so you can see it better. Okay, so you can see that second nick there. There's two. You can see where I sanded the one. Didn't go below any ring marks. And then I sanded the other. There's a couple little scratches, but they're not. I can't really feel them. So we're going to ignore those. They won't. They shouldn't cause any issue whatsoever. So we're just going to go with it. And this motor should be running like a top again in no time. Okay. I, uh,. Pulled the covers off, but I did leave the one blue tape on there. Why not just protect that section? No reason to pull that off until I'm ready to put the head on. The head on the other side, see I don't have it covered. Uh, I'll be putting that one on much sooner than this one because I don't have to pull a piston off there. It depends on when the, the shop calls me that's doing the valves and just cleaning off the ceramic from the valve seats. Uh, but if the shop calls me and tells me it's done today, I'll probably put that head on today as I go and bring the piston into the other place uh, I'll pick up the heads so I guess that's where that sits alright I uh, hopped you on here quick because I figured something out for holding this motor up and it, it's funny simple but works all at the same time so the shocks come through this hole here and so I took the shocks took them loose, you know, pushed them through the hole, and I was able to mount one hand of the ratchet strap onto there, go around the water pump, which has four bolts. It's enough to hold the weight of the motor since the other end's attached to the transmission and transmission mount in the back. And then I ran the ratchet strap to this side. This side had enough of a slot that I could fit the other hook through it by going from this direction and then, I don't know how well you can see that, you can see it decent. And then running the, the strap around through here, over, under, and there's a hole down in the frame on the bottom here that I was able to hook it to. The only reason I needed to do that was, I mean, you can see how long that strap was. When I had that length hooked in this hole here, it was too long and the ratchet actually ended up against the pump there was no way I'd be able to lift up on it but I was able to actually lift the motor once I removed the bolts holding the mounts I was actually able to lift the motor up half inch roughly so I know it's able to support the weight of the motor now now all I have to do is move forward and continue with removing all the parts to drop the cradle down
Okay, I had to lower the thing. Um, I gotta take that clamp off the charge pipe so I can move the charge pipe out of the way. I kind of figured I'd have to do that. I just forgot to do it before I raised it up. Um, otherwise, I'm about to drop the cradle, so I'll get that underway in just a little bit. All right, the next step, I'm going to be dropping the car down so that I can put jack stands on the ground. And then I'm going to zip the four bolts that hold the cradle on the rest. I'm going to zip them out, raise the car so the cradle stays down. I'm going to have to pay really close attention to the motor with that strap on there and make sure there's not an issue with that. Once I get the car up and it, and it feels like it's safe and sturdy, I'm going to take that same post that I used for the brake rotor there to hold the suspension up. Uh, and I'm going to put it in the back here, right on the bell housing, so that I can use it as an extra security to make sure that the motor's not going to fall on me while I'm working on it, just in case that ratchet strap isn't very strong. Um, and then start taking the oil pan down, and we'll see what we have for getting that piston out of there. It shouldn't be, shouldn't be too big of an issue. Uh, let's continue. Okay. Here we are. We got the cradle down. It gave me a hell of a time. Um, now you can see how dirty this thing was. I cleaned it originally when I did it the last time. Uh, I pretty much cleaned it every time. Uh, his problem this time was the power steering hose. There was a clamp that loosened up or whatever and it just sat there and dripped on everything over the storage unit while I was sitting there, you know, in storage doing nothing over the winter. Um, so it made a hell of a mess, and of course, that mess collects dirt and rocks and everything else as he drives it. Um, and he's already driven it a decent amount this year, so there's that. Uh, now, I was talking about doing that pole over there, you know, putting it underneath that bell housing. But after I got the cradle out of the way, I looked at this, and I said, you know, I can just throw a hook there. Throw a hook on the other strap, which is hooked onto that one. Worst case scenario, if it comes out of that hole, it'll just hold itself around the frame anyway. And then I went under the damper. I, I don't have to take that off anyway. In fact, I don't even think I have to turn it because I think the crank is in the correct position. But if I do have to turn it, it's just riding on the belt surface here. So it won't hurt anything. Um, but I will have to take this guy off eventually. Because another thing he wants me to do is this clutch for the AC has failed on this, this car. It... Uh, must have melted or something. It's, it's got a open in the circuit right at the clutch itself. That's actually a new compressor that he bought a while ago and uh, he put it in out of good measure and of course now it's biting him in the butt but it is what it is. Nothing we can do. It, it, it works out because uh, the motor failed shortly after he found that out anyway so now we're able to address it with a lot less labor because that thing is not easy at all to get at with the cradle and everything else on. So next step I will be pulling the pan. Uh, I'm gonna do a time lapse of that and showing you what's inside the bottom end of this car. So I left the cradle down on the floor here, you can't see that, but um, I'm going to work around it. I turned the light off over on the other side of the shop for the simple fact of making sure that you can actually see because that light just makes the camera go crazy and hates it. So uh, I'm going to start ripping and tearing on this thing and we'll, we'll time lapse the work and then when I get to a point where I want to show you what's going on, then I'll slow it down.
Okay, so pan is off, just dripping away, you know, the usual. Um, I gotta take these guys off. They hold the windage tray. This one, which holds not only windage tray, but also the sump. Uh, I forgot about the sump and how difficult it's gonna be. Um, hopefully I can weasel it out without messing with the timing cover. If I have to pull that timing cover off, that's gonna add just a horrendous amount of labor. Um, I'm hoping to avoid that if I can. Uh, we'll see what happens. Something that I should probably note, when it comes to these LS's, I don't know how well you can see that, but you see that, that bolt there? That's actually a double bracket, so that bracket goes across and bridges. Normally, these motors have uh, a single bolt holding it in. It's that inside impossible one to get at, I believe. And uh, they've been known to actually like tip this way and then air gets into the system and takes out the bearings because it loses oil pressure. That little deal is inexpensive and if you got these things apart and you're building one of these motors, it's worth the effort and money to buy it and put it in. It will save this motor's life if, if that thing were to ever even consider coming out of there. Okay, I got the windage tray off. Um, I was able to move that aside. I had to just lightly, t oop, can't see that, lightly kiss this so that uh, I could get that bolt out. This is the one with the actual part that would keep it from twisting. This one here has nothing to do with that, so I just had to loosen it a little bit. And then I was able to swivel this guy out of the way enough to do the work. Um, as far as this goes, that's the position the crank is in right now. And this is the one I have to take off. See, this bolt is up here, so it's not in the right position for me to take it apart. I'll have to turn it a little bit this direction. So what I'll do is I'll get a wrench on the end of the crank and turn it. Um, and I'll set you up so that you can see when I'm doing that. Do a little time lapse on that. Take the rod cap off and then uh, pop it apart. Slow it down so that I can explain everything once I pull that off. Um, here's the pan that I have underneath here to catch things. I just want to show you this quick. Uh, kind of a funny story. It's actually a part of a cart that we had at a shop I used to work at. And I brought it home thinking I might be able to use that for for parts or whatever. And it, it fit on my engine stand perfectly. And then I realized it was sealed because it was catching all the oil and whatever else spilled off the engine in there. And uh, now I use it as a catch-all drain pan for big messy projects like this and it keeps the floor relatively clean. I don't have to mop it near as much, which is really nice. Uh, here is the windage tray that he has. It's a stroker windage tray. Um, it clears the stroke from this engine. Uh, I did not have to shim this one. His last one, which was a stock one, I had to shim a lot. Uh, that was kind of a pain in the butt, and then I had to like take areas like this where, where a rod would get close and, and dent it out. And it was just a disaster. The previous Texas build did not do that and it caused a lot of damage um, now I'm gonna be replacing that he actually found this fancy windage tray I don't know if I'll find it easy enough here there it is but I guess this is supposed to reduce engine friction by directing the air better you can see it's got those baffles in there these are like little one-way baffle things and uh, they're supposed to coincide with the pan itself this is like a crank scraper slash windage tray um, so these baffles this this scrapes the crank clean as close as it can without actually hitting it it's supposed to fit that stroke and then these guys are to keep the oil where the pump actually sumps from which is right here and there's baffles in the pan already and they have holes in them so I think this is supposed to coincide with it go look at the pan quick Okay, yep, you can see it. So there is a hole there. I'm sure there's one there. And then I know there's one back here. So those those things must sit on either side of these and then on the side of this. So it's a very interesting pan, uh, adaptive windage tray slash crank scraper. Uh, maybe, maybe it'll actually increase power, maybe not. We'll, we'll find out. Uh, hopefully we'll find out, I, I guess. It's going to be hard to know, but if he actually does a dyno pull, 
then we'll uh, we'll find out compared to his old dyno. Okay, I uh, I'm about ready to take this apart, but before I set you down and fast forward on this, I found one more valuable note to consider. When it comes to this performance stuff, I don't know how well you can see that. Maybe I'll. There we go. Um, when it comes to this performance stuff, notice the head of that bolt. It's got multiple points. The head of that stud. It's a 12 point is what it's called, if, if you don't already know that. The head of that bolt. 12 point. When it comes to the head studs. They are also 12 point. So, if you do engine work, um, you're going to need a good set of 12 point sockets. It's, it's pretty much a must. Um, if, you, if you do performance engine work. Stock stuff, eh, usually that's that's pretty well six point things. And six point is generally better for being able to grab regular bolts because you don't strip out the, the bolt. But as far as engines go, if you have 12 point on a 12 point actual bolt or nut, it's gonna be a lot stronger that way. So, all right, let's begin. I'm leaving the bolts threaded in a little bit. Uh, reason being is you, you have dowels that are kind of a, they're almost like a press fit that hold the connecting rod cap to the connecting rod. Uh, aside from the bolts themselves, the bolts are the main structure. Uh, so I'm gonna use the actual bolts themselves and just give them a little left tap with a rubber hammer. And that'll knock those dowels out of their position or allow it to separate. There, you can hear the difference in tone, hopefully. Um, when they do separate, it changes the tone of how it sounds when you, when you hit that. So now it's separated. Now all I have to do is take the bolts out the rest of the way and that cap will pretty much fall off of it. Okay, the cap is off. We have a rag so I can show you the bearing surface on, on this end. Now this is the bottom of the rod. This is the side that gets the least amount of stress on that bearing. It is in like almost brand new condition. I'll show you that here in a second. Okay. This is a coated bearing. It's a uh, I forget who makes it. I don't know, but it, it, it's coated. I think it's Calico, if I remember right. But uh, there's a couple different companies that coat them. Um, if I could be more consistent with my ceramic coating, I have a coating that I would be willing to do it with. But I don't trust my sprayer to be even enough that there won't be high or low spots. So I don't mess with, with uh, bearings themselves. It's too tight of a tolerance on those. But, I mean, there is not a scratch in it. Well, maybe that little, little mark. Can't really consider that a scratch. Usually, when you have a scratch in a bearing, I'll set this down. It'll take and it'll, it'll start at one end and go all the way around the whole circle. Because a piece of debris will land in there and sit there and go round and round and round. And then eventually it blows itself out somehow. Uh, so that's where that sits. Now, these rod caps... Uh, small block Chevy and LS have identical rod design. So, for instance, you see this side? There's a very, go out a little bit, there's a very heavy chamfer here, and there is no chamfer here. Uh, this chamfer is for when you have a performance crank, it uh, allows clearance for the way the crank is ground. The non-chamfer goes towards the other rod. There is no chamfer there. This bearing is a lower bearing. A lot of times people will make the bad mistake of putting this bearing on the top and the lower on the bottom, or, or the, the upper on the bottom. And when you do that, this bearing is shifted over and it makes that chamfer worthless. If you have an aftermarket performance crank, it will cause catastrophic failure because that bearing will hit the chamfer on the crank and start grinding metal everywhere. So, don't make that mistake. It's, it's a bad plan. I'm going to have to get a light up here. 
no way I can see much with this camera. Although, you know what, this camera has a light of its own. But I guess I'll do this instead. So when I look at these bearings, there, I just pulled the bearing out instead. So when I look at these bearings, I'm not looking for that the coating is completely there. I'm not looking for uh, there being any any little scratches in it. What I'm looking for is, is obvious clearance problems or debris in the motor. And I'm looking at this bearing now, and it is just awesome. It's rare that you pull a motor apart, and it's so clean. Oh, there's one scratch. See, that's a very, very small. So one little piece of debris got in there at some point. It could have been the smallest of sand that got through the filter and somehow made it past the rake. You never know. Could have been a little piece of dust while I was building the motor. I try and be as clean as possible, but it, it could still happen. So that is in really good shape. There's no problem whatsoever reusing that bearing. Okay, so I took the rubber hammer, and I just took the handle, which, you know, it doesn't really matter that it's a rubber handle, or a hammer, I guess, but uh, I pushed the piston up so that it got just past the rings. Uh, you basically push the butt of the, the handle against the, the end of the rod, and then you just slightly tap with the back, or the palm of your hand, the back of that hammer, or top of that hammer. Um, I was not able to lower the car, I gotta move the cradle, so I'm just standing on the hoist, lowered as far as I could. And uh, standing on the hoist, I'm gonna pull that piston out so I can show you guys what it's gonna look like here. I'll set it up there so it's safe. Oh. Now, you know, I pulled it out this way, right? So, I'm gonna show you thrust versus non thrust side of of uh, pistons and looser fit pistons versus tighter pist fit pistons uh, stroke versus non-stroke so this motor has uh, I believe four inch stroke I'm pretty confident um, I'd have to double check my, my numbers but I'm pretty confident it's a four inch stroke so it's got a fairly substantial stroke and that's why this piston is so short uh, stock pistons are significantly longer this offers an advantage in that it's lighter weight However, it offers a disadvantage in that there's no skirt support to keep the piston from rocking in the cylinder, or at least not very much. So they try and make it as tight as they can to the bore, but when it's a performance application, and these are a forged alloy, it expands more, so they have to build them looser. So what happens is you fire it up, and because it's looser, it, it rocks back and forth quite a bit until it warms up some, expands, and then it fits the cylinder tight and stops rocking. Well, while it's doing that, it wears out. So, see this coating here is kind of gone. Um, this is the thrust side. This side is the receiving end of it. So, as the motor is going round and round, it comes this way and it pushes. Or wait, no, it pushes this way. So it so it pushes it against it like that, right? Because it's pushing that direction, and then it wears the bottom of the skirt down. And then when it comes around, it drags it, and it wears this side down. But it's when it fires, it pushes it, so it wears this side down. So, kind of an interesting little thing to note there. Uh, see where the damage was, and where everything was rubbing against it. I'm surprised the cylinder walls are hard enough not to get all scratched up. I'm going to have to inspect that ring pretty closely. It might actually be damaged. I might have to replace it. But we'll find out. So... All right, my ride is here for lunch, so I'm going to take lunch break, and I'll be right back. Okay, I just uh, ran over to the balance place, picked up the piston. This is the box here. Uh, these are diamond pistons. I've used several different brands. Everybody pretty much makes a reasonable piston. Some of them you have to look out for certain things when you... Uh, before you put them in or before you coat them or whatever. Uh, CP, for instance, a lot of times I've noticed they have, they don't deburr the sharp edges. Like, uh, 
like right here where the valve relief is. If, if that valve relief comes too close to the edge here, they won't. this won't be a soft edge, it'll be a sharp edge. Um, so I gotta take a little piece of sandpaper and just kind of touch it. Uh, I do all that stuff before even bringing the pistons in for balance. Uh, Diamond is pretty good though. They always deburr everything really good. So here is the balance sheet. This is uh, what they send after they, they balance this thing out for when they balance the crank. Um, in order to figure out where they need to add, remove weight, uh, the counterweights of the crank. It's nice to have this sheet for these exact circumstances, rare scenarios when you damage one thing, so you can order that one single piston. So I mentioned the rings that I wanted to salvage before. This is the top ring here. You can see it's it's off to one side, and when I push on it, it doesn't just it doesn't just push back. Okay. So normally I do this, and it should just slide over to the other side. This part where the piston got hit by the the uh, valve seat hitting the head uh, it pushed down where this ring landed and I'll see if I can see what I'm looking at here with you so it pushed down on this and it actually pinched that ring between the the two ring lands here so I will not be using this top ring uh, it's kind of unfortunate because I like to have a nice sealed already broken in ring on there uh, I'll have to use a new ring there's diamonds, instruction sheet stuff they send with everything regardless of whether you know. They always give you a nice little uh, printout job sheet. I ceramic coated this guy already. Oh, stickers of course. There's always stickers in, in boxes. Um, so here's the piston. You can see the skirts aren't worn out. Now, this piston was heavy compared to the spec sheet he gave me. Let's see if I can show you this here. Oh, of course, I got a phone call, so I'll have to take that. Well, that call was interrupting, but it was actually the customer, so that's okay. Alright, so anyway. This, uh, this piston here, you can see that large cut down here? Uh, that's to remove weight and balance it. Uh, most of the strength actually doesn't come from this area. Unfortunately, this piston was quite heavy, so he had to remove a decent amount of material. Uh, most of the strength comes from these side bolstering areas. This is like a big bridged area that goes across. So you can see that there, and then he cut it here as well. So he can't cut this direction because that's the valve relief, and that would be prone to cracking. And that's also the valve relief on the other side here. So he cuts that direction and removes the material underneath this perch. Um, and this one was a little bit tougher just because he had to be careful not to remove too much structurally. But he also had to get it so it was the correct weight. So there's the piston. Oh, yeah, I was going to mention that. Here's the ceramic coating, this, this Cerakote piston coat stuff. It's very, very strong um, and very good at the heat resistance thing. And it actually looks really nice, too. So uh, with that said, I've actually used it for more than piston coat. Um, one thing recently, I've actually used it on my knife that I carry with me, and I use this on a regular basis as a tool. Um, I got the piston coat on the handle, I just like the color, and then I did the just a Cerakote black on the blade. And let's see if we can see that. There's the wear mark. And actually, I'm going to be prepping some parts for coating later today. So here we got... Uh, cylinder heads they came back from the machinist too just bring this guy over here take a look Got a little bit of oil on there from from doing the valves but there's what basically it looks like there we go that's a little bit better look so there's that looks good now what I'm gonna be doing later today and I'll do a separate video for that but uh, I got these parts here. This is actually for this car that I'm working on now. It's uh, an upgrade, a pulley upgrade. Um, but I don't think we're going to put it on yet. We might do a, a dyno before and then put this on and then dyno after. See how big of a difference it makes. Um, 
but he won't be able to use that on the road course you know if to turn the car way down this is a, a turbo exhaust side housing that's for uh, Hibusa, a turbo Busa and this is also for the Busa just the exhaust manif or header manifold whatever you want to call it so there's that um, I'm gonna go ahead and get moving on this car again I think see what I can get accomplished yet today okay so I'm gonna start assembling this uh, piston here putting it on the rod I'm gonna start with the spiral locks I'll show you what these these guys are like here when you you got them they're like that two of them go on each side of the piston so I'll go ahead and put them on one side first I'll go grab my assembly lube put it on the wrist pin start sliding the wrist pin through slide the rod in uh, the rod goes in a certain way I suppose I could show you that so on the uh, driver's side it's one through seven um, weird black mark there but it's nothing so driver's side one through seven now when you look at pistons they always mark it somehow Let's see if I can see it or not okay there you go see that little F that F is for front right that way these valve relieves are in the right spot so if it was in the car the car the front of the car is facing that way it would sit this direction now one through seven sit on the forward side of the bearing so this chamfer that's on here has to go on the uh, counterbalance weight part of the crank the non chamfer side has to go on the side that meets the other rod so chamfer on one through seven goes to the front chamfer on two through eight goes to the rear stick it in like this and that's how it's going to sit so i'll go ahead and get started on that now all right i'm going to go grab the lube and we'll fast through the rest of this Okay, I got those on. Um, saw the first one was a complete pain in the butt for me, and the last one. Uh, when you do an entire set, it it's like the first piston you do is always the toughest one. Uh, I don't know, guy forgets how to do the same job he's always been doing, uh, I guess. But once you get a couple of them down, it starts moving a lot faster. Um, yeah, basically that's that's about all there is there. But this guy. See if we can see it good enough. Okay, there we go. See all those lines there from the, the spiral locks? You want to make sure those are all flush against each other. If any one of them is, is raised out, it's not fully seated, you need to make sure you address that. Um, either the ring has lost its tension because you accidentally bent it, or it's just not, fell, it didn't fall into place yet. And that would most likely be the top one if that was the case. So. This one is ready to go there. I got to do the ring thing, but other than the ring thing, we'll we'll be on our way pretty soon. Uh, that chamfer that I mentioned, it's on the rod and the cap. Make sure those are the same direction. If I were to put it this way, obviously that would not be right. So that direction. I'm going to do because I'm not assembling it yet. So I'm just going to put it together just enough to hold it. I'm going to take the bolts, throw them in there a little bit. Turns out we do got to order rings. I thought it came with rings in the box, but all it came with was the locking ring. Um, you can see that this guy is a, a lock ring. It, it's it's basically to make sure that the oops that the oil groove doesn't pop out of this. Um, since that wrist pin is cut into the oil groove slot.